Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to talk about the case of the Queen and Barnes. This is a really important decision because it was the first case to really try to tackle what it means for something to be a safe for the purposes of the firearm storage regulations. The reason why this matters is because you'll have different standards for how something has to be stored if it's in a safe versus if it's in a securely locked container. So, for example, restricted firearms, like handguns, need to additionally have a trigger lock if they're in a securely locked container, but that's not required if it's in a safe. So whether or not your particular container is a safe versus not a safe can mean the difference between you committing a criminal offense or being perfectly within the legislation. However, this term was not defined in the law, so that's a big problem. It, they've left it to the courts. This is a provincial court decision, so a, another jurisdiction could reject it. Similarly, it could be overturned by a higher court. However, I've used this case successfully in Alberta, and I think it's going to be strongly persuasive. However, not necessarily determinative. Let's have a look at the actual case itself. So here we've got Queen and Barnes. Harry Barnes is charged with 18 counts of storing a firearm contrary to a regulation made under the Firearms Act, contrary to Section 86, Sub 2 of the Criminal Code. The reason why there's 18 counts is that there's 18 guns here. I, my understanding is that he had more than 18 guns, but this is just 18 guns that trigger the particular issue in this case. However, uh, one thing people ask when they see this is they say, if he's convicted on 18 counts, is he going to get the same sentence as, as if he committed one count multiplied by 18? And that's not typically how it works. He'd get maybe a little bit of a jump because there's 18 instead of one, but they're not going to just multiply it. Mr. Barnes is a firearms collector. He is the owner of a large number of firearms and weapons, most of which have historical significance. In particular, he is licensed to possess prohibited firearms, including the fully automatic firearms involved in these charges. All of the defendant's guns are properly registered. The charges arise out of the execution of a public safety warrant issued pursuant to Section 117.04 of the Criminal Code at Mr. Barnes' apartment. No challenge has been made to the validity of the warrant. If Mr. Barnes is found guilty of these offenses, Crown Counsel is seeking forfeiture of the firearms pursuant to Section 491 of the Criminal Code. Should the criminal charges be dismissed, Ms. Panzer has brought an application for forfeiture of the defendant's seized weapons under Section 117.05 of the Code. So there's a few things going on here. First, Mr. Barnes is a legal owner, or was, I understand he passed away in 2016, but he was a, the legal owner of fully automatic firearms, which means that he was grandfathered in. He owned these before the ban came in and was allowed to continue possessing them. So that's the first thing here. The second thing is that when we see in paragraph four, they're saying, if we get a conviction, then we want to keep his guns. If we don't get a conviction, then we want to bring this forfeiture application. So they're actually trying two separate strategies here. Both of these approaches are interesting legally. However, in this video, I'm just going to cover the first one because I don't want to get into too many issues. The video will get to be too long. And this is really when people say, you know, the Queen and Barnes, when they cite it, usually they're citing it for the, the safe issue here, which is the first issue. So he was alleged to have breached the following bit of regulation. It's a big wall of text, but we'll sort of go through it because it's important here. An individual may store a prohibited firearm only if, first, it is unloaded. Second, it is rendered inoperable by means of a secure locking device and stored in a container, receptacle, or room that is kept securely locked, and that it is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. And if the prohibited firearm is an automatic firearm, which we've already learned these are, uh, that has a removable bolt or bolt carrier. The bolt or bolt carrier is removed and stored in a room that is different from the room in which the automatic firearm is stored, that is kept securely locked, and that is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. Or, so it's got to either meet one or two, or two, stored in a vault, safe, or room that has been specifically constructed or modified for the secure storage of prohibited firearms, and it is kept securely locked. Note the construction here is a little ambiguous, but the courts have typically held that it's essentially stored in a vault 
or a safe or a room that has been specifically constructed or modified for the secure storage of prohibited firearms. So that last bit about constructed or modified uh, affects room, but not vault or safe. So any vault or any safe is fine. And that's certainly the interpretation that the court follows in this one. There's no argument about whether or not the, uh, the safe has been specifically constructed. And it can't be readily accessible to ammunition unless it's stored with the firearm in a container receptacle or a vault safe or room. So the big issue here, and they'll get to it here, actually I'll let the court uh, sort of explain. The initial defense position in relation to the charges is that the defendant's prohibited firearms were not being stored, but were being used as Mr. Barnes was in his residence at the time the warrant was executed. In my opinion, the Supreme Court's judgment in the Queen and Carlos has made it clear that a firearm has been stored when it has been put aside and the defendant is not making any immediate use of it. The 18 guns in question were all located inside of two locked metal cabinets when the police attended to execute the warrant. This is a case involving storage. I want to talk about this for a moment because I hear this argument from people or I see it online all the time. They say, if you're at home, then your guns aren't being stored they're in use. So you don't have to follow the storage requirements so long as you're at home. That's not the case. The uh, The Supreme Court, ha and I'll go over the Queen and Carlos in another video, but you can have your things in storage while you're at home. And if you set the guns aside to do something else, you know, you have your guns out and then you decide to go play a video game for a while, that gun is probably transitioned to being in storage. And so just assuming that because your home means that they're not in storage, it could be a very expensive and problematic mistake for you. So that's not the law and it can get you into a lot of trouble. Mr. Costa has also submitted that there was compliance with the regulation as Mr. Barnes prohibited firearms were stored in accordance with the requirements of Section 7B2 because they're in a safe a statutory alternative to 7B1, which would be the securely locked container. It is not disputed that all 18 of the firearms involved in these charges are operable prohibited firearms. So they're they're functioning. None of them are de dis, are dewatted, none of them are, you know, disabled in any fashion. These are working guns. The guns were put away together with their removable bolts or bolt carriers, contrary to section 7B1. However, if he can fall within 7B2, he's still good. The ammunition was stored separately from the firearms consistent with Section 7C, and the guns were not kept in a vault or a room that was specially constructed or modified for the storage of prohibited firearms as contemplated by 7B2. The issue in this case is whether the prohibited firearms were stored in a safe as permitted by Section 7B2. In such circumstances, it is permissible for removable bolts or bolt carriers to be stored with the prohibited firearms, and there would be no violation of the regulations. So you see what's happened here. If the containers he's got his things stored in are a safe, then he's good. 100% legal, everything is fine. If they're not a safe, if they're only a securely locked container, then he's in trouble. Then he's violated the law and he's going to lose his guns. So this is a big issue for Mr. Barnes in this circumstance. So the relevant evidence. The guns in issue were housed in metal cabinets in a locked bedroom. 16 of the automatic firearms were located beside the closet in a gray steel cabinet which had a T-shaped handle with a lock in it. After a key is used to unlock that cabinet, the handle must be turned in order to release metal rods in the top, bottom, and center of the door that slide into the frame of the unit. The police had to move the cabinet in order to get access to the guns as it was facing a wall and situated so the door could only open about 12 inches wide. The other two prohibited firearms were in a padlock steel cabinet at the foot of the bed near the window. Mr. Barnes testified that this cabinet had an internal lock as well as the padlock. So there's two kinds of cabinets here. One of them has these bars that extend out into the door, and that's, you know, an anti-prying measure. And the other one just has an internal lock and a padlock. So they're, they're very different cabinets. And, of course, the lower standard is one that he, he's still hoping that the lower standard of those counts as a safe, because otherwise he's going to get convicted and problems follow from that. The defendant purchased the cabinets he used to store his guns at a government auction. He agreed that they all had air vents and did not have seals around the doors. 
None of the cabinets had an electronic lock or a keypad or a drill-resistant steel plate behind the locks. According to Mr. Barnes, his gun lockers would be difficult to pry op or to open with a pry bar. I'm not sure why the air vents was such a big issue here. Uh, are they assuming that the guns themselves are going to turn into a gas and leak out? Or that maybe some sort of supernatural creature is going to show up that can turn into a vapor and... I don't understand why the air vents were a big deal here, or the seals around the door. But that's neither here nor there, I suppose. Michael Press, a civilian member of the Toronto Police Service, was qualified as an expert in the regulations made under the Firearms Act and the storage and handling of firearms. I'm just going to stop here and say that this is a little weird, because normally expert evidence is expert evidence as to, you know, scientific principles or factual issues. You don't normally, you're not normally able to call an expert in the law because that's the job of the judge. The judge is the trier of law, and so that's the judge's job. Having somebody who's an expert in the law, well, again, that's supposed to be the judge, and you're not supposed to have sort of lay or, you know, civilian members of the Toronto Police Service testifying as to what the law is. This seems strange to me, but... Without ordering a full transcript, I can't really get beyond what's going, what this simple sentence here. But I, I don't know. This seems a little, this seems fishy to me. I'll leave it there. Mr. Press was present in Mr. Barnes' residence during the execution of the warrant. He described the containers used by the defendant to store his guns as school lockers. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a school locker when I was in high school that had sort of bars that extend into the sides, the bottom and the top. But, so this may be an unfair characterization. In Mr. Press's opinion, the defendant's gun lockers met the definition of a cabinet or receptacle that is kept securely locked and is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken into. However, he did not believe that the lockers would qualify as a safe as they did not have a level or extended locking mechanism that could not be knocked off with a sledgehammer. The Crown's expert also stated that the metal construction of the locker should have been harder or heavier in order to be considered a safe. However, no measurement was made of the thickness of the metal on any of the lockers. According to Mr. Press, gun lockers such as the ones made by Canadian Tire, if you're a gun owner, you've probably, you probably know which ones they're talking about here, did not meet the definition of a safe and should only be used to store prohibited firearms if the bolts or bolt carriers are removed. The basis for Mr. Press's interpretation of the word safe and its characteristics were not explained in his testimony. No objective source for his understanding of the language of the regulation was provided either from his training, judicial consideration of the word, or authoritative reference materials. This is a little bit of judicial, not really snark, but sort of explaining this guy's not a great witness here. He doesn't you know, he's saying that the metal needs to be heavier, but he doesn't actually provide any measurements. There's no, you know, indication of that. I kind of wonder what the Crown Prosecutor on this one was doing, why they didn't elicit this evidence. If this is, if this is the basis of why they're trying to bring this, uh, this case here, is that they're saying that the metal's not thick enough. I'd want to know how thick it was. And similarly, when they ask him, you know, why he's saying that this is a safe versus not a safe, He's got nothing. Like, there's nothing here other than just his personal feelings. Again, I'm not sure that that's an appropriate place for an expert witness. Why is this expert talking about what is and isn't a safe if there's no background to his expertise here? If it's just his personal thoughts? That doesn't seem helpful to me. And so I'm not sure that he should have been allowed to be an expert in this. But regardless, he was. We'll move on. Richard Kornblum was qualified as a defense expert in firearms and their storage. Mr. Kornblum is the president of Movie Armaments Group, a supplier of firearms and military equipment to the movie industry, which is a way cooler job than I have. His company is licensed to manufacture, transport, import, export, and store prohibited firearms and weapons. Mr. Kornblum is a licensed gunsmith and is licensed to possess prohibited firearms. In Mr. Kornblum's opinion, a safe is a metal-sided cabinet that locks. He referred to a definition of safe from Black's Law Dictionary cited in an article on safe and legal storage of non-restricted firearms from the National Firearms Association on the Great Canadian Sportsman website. Shout out to the NFA here. They have uh, good work on their part and good work with for Mr. Kornblum here. 
Uh, the definition describes a safe as a metal container for the storage of valuables. On this basis, Mr. Kornblum testified that he believes the defendant's gun lockers are safes. Mr. Kornblum has not been to the defendant's residence. His opinion is premised on a view of the photographs made exhibits in the case, as well as an examination of other photographs that were not made evidence at the trial. So he's just looking at pictures and looking at the dictionary here. Black's Law Dictionary, a lot of people think it's a sort of special, you know, like it's a holy book of, for the law. It's really not. It's just a dictionary. I have one. I haven't used it much, but sometimes it does get referenced. So statutory interpretation, which is when we have an unclear law, as in this case, because there's no definition of safe, how do we figure that out? What are the rules? So the word safe is not defined in the storage, display, transportation, and handling of firearms by individuals regulations, the Firearms Act, or in the criminal code. The approach to be followed in such circumstances is... In order to determine the meaning of an undefined term in a statute, it is now well established that a court is to read the words making up the term in their entire context and in their grammatical and ordinary sense harmoniously with the scheme of the act, the object of the act, and the intention of parliament. So basically what that means is you look at the context, you look at the ordinary meaning, and you try to figure out sort of what definition makes sense for the actual bit of legislation that you're looking at. So the dictionary definitions of safe generally describe the noun as a strong container, usually of metal, and provided with a secure lock for storing valuables. And in some dictionaries, the definition of safe also includes the quality of being fireproof. Within the context of Section 7 itself, it is apparent that Parliament considered a safe that is securely locked to be a more secure method of storage than a container or receptacle that is kept securely locked and is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken into or open. This is evident from the fact that the gun stored pursuant to Section 7B1, which is the not a safe category, must be rendered inoperable by a secure locking device, whereas the firearms stored in accordance with Section 7B2 have no such requirement. Moreover, containers and receptacles may be constructed of wood or plastic, as opposed to the more durable metal from which a safe is traditionally made. So basically, container is here, safe is at a higher level. Safe is considered a more secure fashion. So I'm going to skip over some of this because it's essentially talking about how dangerous prohibited weapons are. Let's go and look at the more interesting parts of this. Even where a gun storage unit is described as a safe, there may be considerable variations in its characteristics, including size, weight, wall thickness, the location of the hinges, the nature of the locking mechanism, and resistance to water or fire. See, for example, exhibits, and there's a big long list of them. I'm guessing that these were probably pictures tendered at the trial to show different models of safe that exist on the market. Unlike jurisdictions such as California, Parliament has not chosen to designate minimum standards for gun safes or certify certain types of safes as meeting the regulatory requirements. So they left it open, which creates a risk for the ordinary gun owner who is sitting there trying to decide is this thing I have a safe or is it a container? What does this count as? What that means is that the court is going to have to grapple a bit with the possibility that if they set the standard high, there's going to be a bunch of people who thought they were in compliance with the law who suddenly aren't. So they don't talk about that in this decision, but I'm sure it was on the justice's mind. The concerns expressed by Mr. Press about the vulnerability of gun storage units, such as those belonging to Mr. Barnes, to bolt cutters, sledgehammers, and other methods of forced entry are understandable. Yet Mr. Kornblum's observation that given time and the right degree of skill, all safes are vulnerable to being broken into is a valid one. So if you look here at someone like Lockpicking Lawyer, who's also on YouTube, people who are good at defeating locks and safes and so forth, Often the exploits, including on very expensive safes and locks and so forth, are quite rapid. The underwriter's laboratory certifies safes as sort of having time ratings for various forms of attack. The way that works is essentially they'll say, you know, if somebody comes at this safe with explosives, how long is it going to take them? If they come at this safe with tools, how long is that going to take them to get in? And most people are surprised to learn that these ratings are actually a lot lower than they expect because safes are just are not, they're not perfectly burglar proof. And in many, 
a dedicated person can get into anything given enough time. Often the rating for explosives, for instance, on a consumer safe is zero minutes. They'll just get in right away. And tools might be, for instance, 15 minutes. You know, somebody with power tools will get in this real quick. Now, in terms of security applications, normally you'd have layering. And so normally it's not such a big deal if it takes somebody 15 minutes to get into a safe because you'd have other security measures. You know, the bank vault at the bank, you can get into that if you've got enough time and enough tools. However, you are not likely to have enough time and enough tools before the police response arrives. So a safe is really a delaying tactic as opposed to a perfect security tactic. There is no, it's not a magic box that keeps out burglars. So that's a consideration here when we start talking about this because whatever tools you talk about, there's always a tool to get into a safe. Since a, since a breach of the regulation leads to a criminal charge, there must be a discernible standard for licensed individuals to meet in storing automatic firearms. See the Queen and Smiley. In my view, an interpretation of the word safe in its ordinary dictionary meaning of a metal container with a secure lock is consistent with the objectives of the legislation and the intent of Parliament. I find that the cabinets in which the defendant's prohibited firearms were stored fall within the definition of a safe. Both of the lockers in which the prohibited firearms were stored were made of steel. Each cabinet was securely locked, one by a key and a padlock, the other by a locking system that uses a key to unbolt rods in the door from the frame of the unit. Indeed, despite their disagreement on other issues, the Crown and the defense expert both accepted that the units were securely locked. The Crown has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that there was non-compliance with the regulation. The charges are dismissed. So paragraph 21 and 22 really just very simply say, these are safes, at least for the purposes of this. So this is a, a big, you know, big deal here because it tells us that th the containers, for instance, a Canadian tire, you know, safe is good enough. It counts. And if Parliament wanted to set a higher standard, that was up to them to do. But otherwise, people are entitled to rely on the ordinary meaning, which includes a metal container to store valuables. Now, different metal containers may have different qualities. So you can't simply say that any metal container is necessarily going to be good enough. And again, different courts in different jurisdictions, another court may say, we don't like this case. We're going to, you know, go a different way. So there is risk in that as well. But I really like this case because for one thing, the language in it is very clear. It's very accessible. And I always appreciate that. There's a tendency in the law to make the language overly dense overly complicated, um, unnecessary use of Latin, these sorts of things that make the law difficult to grasp for the ordinary, ordinary citizen. I'm not a fan of that. I try to make the law a little more understandable myself, but it's nice when it's clear writing. It's, so I appreciate that in this decision. It also makes a lot of sense because when you think about it, the people who got to draft the legislation is Parliament. And the owners of firearms are the people who are just sort of receiving the legislation. They don't have much of a say in terms of how this is defined. And so putting the, the burden of proper definition on Parliament makes sense here. Parliament, if they decide that they don't like this definition, can come back and revise it. And unfortunately, the government is talking about doing something like that, which may impact a lot of gun owners. But absent that, we should sort of give the benefit of the confusion or the benefit of the ambiguity here to the gun owners themselves. And that's really what this decision does. So again, I really like this decision. It's good for gun owners, but I think it's just good legal sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I've been able to use this case here in Alberta to, to good effect. And it's a, an important case for any gun owner to, to know and to understand. However, I do put the caution again, provincial court decision out of Ontario. It is not sort of set in stone. Another court could say, we don't like this. So be aware of that possibility when you're making your decisions. If you're unclear about your particular storage, you may want to talk to a lawyer and say, what do you think? Do you think this is good enough? 
or you may want to err on the side of caution because an expensive safe is cheaper than a criminal trial. Anyway, I hope that you found this interesting or educational. Uh, if you have, please like, share, and subscribe. It does help the channel grow. We've seen tremendous growth here, and hopefully that'll continue. I really appreciate your support. It's, it's really been a surprise to me, but it's appreciated. I also want to thank my $10 Patreon supporters, my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackelsdack, Jean-Alexandre Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter Heinem, Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, and Toys Are For Boys. I'll leave a link to my Patreon below as well as to the case itself. And I guess I'll leave also a case, uh, a link to a news article about uh, Mr. Barnes. It sounds like he lived a very interesting life. Again, he passed in 2016. So I guess the sad postscript to all of this is that in the end, the government will have gotten his guns most likely because uh, there's not a there's a very shrinking pool of people that uh, those sorts of firearms can go to nowadays. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.